So they became a object of compassion. Even the people that were ruling over them benefited from their presence in that sense. And so God even blessed the people that were wronging them and had dragged them into this by their presence in their society. That's the kind of loving God that we serve. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today comes from the Book of Psalms. And really the only setup you need for this particular psalm is to know that ultimately this psalm is about the desert wanderings. So you may remember that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai, they had the whole episode with the golden calf, Moses brings down the laws, and then they start wandering around in the desert for 40 years, not able to enter the Canaan land, but still having several conflicts with some of the, the paganistic societies living sort of on the outskirts of Judea. And so we see what happens with them in this psalm, Psalm 104, and we'll be looking specifically at verses 34 through 39. And we'll actually continue on and go all the way through verses 46, but for now, verses 34 through 39. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded, but they mingled with the nations and learned their practices and served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to the demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with the blood. Thus, they became unclean in their practices and played the harlot in their deeds. So do you see what happened there? The Israelites were given very clear instructions. When you go into the land of Canaan, you are to destroy them. Was that because God hated those people or didn't care about them? No. It was because of the deeds that they had done. It was based on their own wickedness. So why were they supposed to destroy them? Well, the psalm actually answers that question. They were supposed to destroy them because God knew if they didn't, those people were not going to repent. And if those people didn't repent, the evil was going to spread. They refused to confront the evil that God told them to, and because they refused to confront it, they became it. That's the problem that they ran into. It's kind of like that line in The Dark Knight. You remember Two-Face, Harvey Dent says it. He says, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become a villain. They had the option of fighting evil and doing exactly what God said, destroying the evil that had infected the land that they were going into. They chose not to. And because of that, they started living with them, mingling with them, marrying their daughters, bringing in their culture. And because of that, they started worshiping their gods. They kept doing that and kept doing that and kept doing that until eventually they got to the point. They were willing to kill their own sons and daughters in the name of these gods of the culture they had been absorbed into. That's why God told them to destroy these people, because he knew if they did not, that was going to be the long-term result. You see, that's why it was okay for them to destroy them back then. It's not okay for us to do that now because they had direct orders from God. God can see the results of things like that that we can't. But the message is the same. If you refuse to fight evil and confront it and defeat it, what is going to happen is that you will accept it. You will buy into it. And eventually, you will become it. God opposed them because of what they were doing to their sons and daughters. And after a long enough time of Israel disobeying God, 
they became the ones that were actually sacrificing their sons and daughters to Moloch. That's what happened for them. A society that refuses to confront evil will eventually become evil itself. They refused to punish the guilty, which eventually turned into them killing the innocent. They wouldn't kill the evil people. And because they refused to do that, eventually they wound up killing the innocent people, sacrificing them to the pagan gods. You see, a society killing their children or sacrificing them, that is the ultimate sign that they have absorbed the evil around them and they have refused to obey God. That's like the final thing. And it crops up in societies all throughout human history. Unfortunately, that's just the way of the world, especially the pre-Christian world. Because if you refuse to confront that evil, you will eventually engage yourself in that evil. You only have two options. You can't be neutral. You can't tolerate it. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, my neighbor is over there murdering his son and burning him alive to please Moloch. But yeah, I mean, I'm not going to do anything about that. No, you can't do that. You have to confront evil or you will become that evil yourself. If you tolerate it long enough, you'll eventually engage yourself in it. That's the way that it works. So let's go ahead and look further in on this psalm, Psalm 106. I think I actually said 104 earlier. This is um, Psalm 106. Sorry about that. So Psalm 106 verses 40 through 43. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people. And he abhorred his inheritance. Then he gave them into the hand of the nations, and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were subdued under their power. Many times he would deliver them. They, however, were rebellious in their counsel, and so sank down in their iniquity. So this is the eventual result of exactly what I was just talking about that you had the society that refused to confront evil and eventually became evil. And this was the result. God had delivered them over and over again. And at a certain point, God didn't deliver them anymore. It's like, you know what? I've delivered you out of their hand. You keep trying to go back into it. Okay. This actually reminds me of a C.S. Lewis quote where he said, essentially, in the end, there are only two kinds of people. Ones that say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, all right, have it your way. That's a sad thing to think about it, but it's the truth. God is merciful. He is long-suffering. He does everything he can to give his children the absolute best possible scenario and opportunity to serve him. But a certain point comes that if his children are stubborn and stiff-necked and refuse to listen to him and refuse to obey him, he says, all right. Have it your way. Let me know how that works out for you. Doesn't mean he abandons them, but he turns them over to their desires. He allows them to do what they want to do. And he takes his hand away. He no longer saves them from the consequences of their actions. In the same way that a loving father might try to protect his son from making dumb decisions, but at a certain point he has to say, all right, you're bound and determined to grab onto that electric fence. Have at it, son. You want to stick a penny in the light socket? See how that works out for you? Now, a good father will also set enough parameters to where the son doesn't, like, you know, die from that so that he doesn't, um, you know, wind up hurting himself beyond that point. But my point in all of that is, at a certain point, you have to let them do what they want to do so that they can learn that it's not such a good idea. And that's where God had come uh, to Israel in this particular passage. The time had come for him to say, all right, you want to live like pagans? You're going to live like pagans. You want to be just like them? Okay, you're going to be ruled by them. You're going to live under their rules instead of mine. Let me know how that works out for you. It is a loving and corrective thing to do, but God had to turn them over to that for at least a little while so that they could learn their lesson. You know, it reminds me of this really great episode of The Cosby Show, and I know that I understand Cosby's persona non grata and should be not, not saying that we should overlook what he did, but you know, the content of his show can still be really good. And there's one really good episode that I remember 
It's where Rudy is bound and determined to stay up late. She doesn't like the fact that she has a bedtime. She doesn't like that her older siblings get to stay up later than her. And she sees this as wildly unfair and she wants to stay up and watch the late show and all of this other stuff. And so eventually Cliff and his wife come together, have a conversation. And they say, you know what, Rudy, you do what you want. You can stay up as late as you want, but you're getting up and going to school in the morning. And that first morning was real rough for her. And after about three or four days of having very little sleep, she decided, you know what? Maybe it is a good idea that I go to bed at the time my parents prescribed. Because she had a little chance to live out the consequences of her actions. And after doing so, she decided maybe mom and dad were onto something and maybe it's not just a bunch of arbitrary rules that they set up for no apparent reason. Maybe there actually is some wisdom behind what my parents are telling me to avoid. And because of that, she started modeling her own behavior after what her parents had instructed her to do. And so that's exactly the scenario that God is in with Israel at this point. Because especially when people talk about God's wrath and his judgment, they typically talk about that in terms of God like going forth and doing something specifically. And God certainly does that in the Bible. I'm not saying that that's not a thing that he does. But more often than not, it's not so much that God like goes out of his way to thump somebody when they've stepped out of line. It's more like he just sort of turns them over to let them live out the life that they desire. I mean, that's Romans 1 all over. He's just basically stepping back and saying, all right, you're bound and determined to try this out. Go ahead. We'll see. We'll see what happens. And hopefully they have the good sense to do what Rudy did and eventually decide, maybe I should have listened to God on that one. Maybe he was on to something there. But either way, Let's go ahead and look at the end of this, because I, I really think that this really brings the entire passage together in a, a very good way. This is verses 44 through 46. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry, and he remembered his covenant for their sake, and relented according to the greatness of his loving kindness. He also made them objects of compassion in the presence of of all their captors. Was God mad at Israel? Oh, yeah. Was he right to be mad at Israel? No question about it. Did he still come back for them? He did. Once they realize the error of their ways, once they realize, okay, we've got ourselves in a situation we are not going to get out of by ourselves. Once they figured that out and called to him, God came running. It's just like the story of the prodigal son. When the son realizes, yeah, my life kind of sucks and it's all my fault and dad living with him wasn't bad. When he goes back there, what does the father do? He runs to greet his son. When the one lamb goes astray, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes to find that lamb. Once it realizes the situation that it's in when he hears it calling. That's exactly what happened here. Yeah, God was upset. Yeah, God turned them over in hopes that they would correct themselves and learn their lesson. But once they did, God couldn't come running fast enough. And it says that he made them an object of compassion, even amongst their captors. So they became a object of compassion even the people that were ruling over them benefited from their presence in that sense. And so God even blessed the people that were wronging them and had dragged them into this by their presence in their society. That's the kind of loving God that we serve. You know, you probably could have watched the, the beginning two passages of that, read just that, and been like, whoo, God's wrath is spicy. And when it comes, you do not want to be there. And you'd be correct in that assessment. That is not an incorrect way to read that verse. But there's a reason the end of that psalm results in forgiveness and a turning around of Israel's behavior. Because that's the message that God has for all of his children. He wants them to repent. He didn't turn them over to their vile affections and uh, killing their children, which, you know, unfortunately in this country we've done. He didn't do that because he wanted to. He did it because he thought that was the only way to get them to come back to him and realize what they had done. 
and he was right. When it comes to us, I really pray that this country realizes the evil that it is engaged in. And you know what? We did that with slavery. We realized what we were doing was abhorrent and wrong. And we were able to correct it. Now, it took a very bloody and costly civil war to do it, but we did it. We can do the same thing with abortion, too. We will humble ourselves. We will cry out to the Lord. We will recognize what we did was wrong and say, you know what, Lord, we're willing to do it your way now. We tried it our way. Didn't pan out so well for us. Please come back and forgive us. He'll come. He always does. And if our nation will turn to him on bended knee and pray for him and cry out that he will come rescue us, he'll treat us exactly the way Israel was. And we will be that city on a sh uh, shining on a hill. We will be that beacon for the rest of the world to follow that example as well. That's what God wants, not just for us, but for everybody. See, that's the difference in love and apathy. An unconcerned father might just allow a child to suffer the consequences of their actions because he doesn't want to get involved or he doesn't think they deserve his time. That's not why God did that. It's because he knew they could be better. And he put them through that and allowed them to go through that process for them to realize, yeah, yeah, we can do better and we need to do better. Because doing it God's way was way better than what we were trying to do now. America can have that same thing. All we have to do is repent and turn back to him. God will not hold us guiltless. There will be a cost. There is a price to pay for the 63 million children we have allowed to die that we have killed. That's not going to be something that can just be erased or swept under the rug. But if we will turn back to him now and stop it now, he will be significantly more merciful to us. If we turn to him, he will come for us. He always does. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. Stay the course, friends. This is usually the part of the video where I ask you to like this video and subscribe to my show and click the notification bell. Does that guarantee you're going to get notifications when I post new content? Honestly, the way that YouTube censors conservatives, I really doubt it. But you know what liking and subscribing does do for sure? It ticks off the dark cyber overlords at Google when they see those likes and subscriptions despite shadow banning my conservative content. So you really should like and subscribe, if nothing else, just to stick it to them.